Hello and welcome to this uh, video meant to really introduce uh, the Odyssey by Homer to new readers, or maybe readers looking to re-engage with this poem that was taught to them a long time ago. Um, first of all, I highly recommend this translation. I, I'm not a scholar. I don't know ancient Greek. I'm just a high school teacher who uh, really loves to, to teach this poem and to discuss it with students. Um, when I started teaching the Odyssey, I taught Fitzgerald's translation, which has merit, obviously, and the Fagel's translation I taught for several years. For a lot of reasons, uh, this one I find works best with, with my freshmen. Um, and I highly recommend, rather than me try to explain why, I really recommend getting it. Um, and the introduction, Emily Wilson's introduction, which does have spoilers, uh, is really a reason by itself to buy the book. But anyway, Homer's The Odyssey. And what we're going to do is we're going to discuss five things that I feel would be helpful when entering into this uh, weirdly relatable and also the weirdly foreign epic poem. Uh, the first thing with a group of students live that I would do would simply brainstorm on the board what it is we know about this. And nowadays, because it's a generation of students, many of whom grew up with the Lightning Thief books, um, have the Percy Jackson books, have a sense of at least a mythological landscape and the gods. So that that recently has been really, really helpful. Uh, but it might not be bad just to t take inventory of what it is you know, and I would also include your sort of preconceived notions um, about about this book. So here are the five the five things uh, the five things that we're going to discuss. First, that the Odyssey is a sequel to Homer's other surviving epic poem, the Iliad. Uh, secondly, the Odyssey is yes, an epic poem. Third. Uh, and this doesn't get discussed much, but I think it's vital to enter the spirit of the poem. The Odyssey is a world in which all people of all ranks, everyone, uh, all these people were under the constant threat of enslavement. Fourth, the Odyssey is a population of characters that value the virtue of Xenia, what we call now hospitality. And fifth, the Odyssey is a place where the men aspired to the value of kleos, or glory, in order to become immortalized through stories. Uh, heroic behavior would then lead to immortality. Okay, so first, it is a sequel to Homer's epic, The Iliad. I read recently that... Um, some scholars believe that Homer had written several epic poems, not just the Iliad and the Odyssey, and that they were destroyed in the burning of the Library of Alexandria. We have no idea. We have the Iliad and the Odyssey, and they're both pretty formidable. So uh, I think that's enough for now. However, uh, it is a sequel to the Iliad. One, uh, one doesn't have to read the Iliad to read the Odyssey, but I think it's good to have some basic information. So I just need you all to know that I will be. Throughout this presentation, this could be a hundred presentations. I'm trying to compress all of this and simplify this just to give uh, essentials so that we can enter the Odyssey in a thoughtful, not intimidating way. So here's a ridiculously brief summary. The Iliad is an epic poem written by the Greek poet Homer. And just, just that idea of who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. It's sort of like in English literature, the debate about who wrote Shakespeare, although I think we have a lot more evidence that Shakespeare wrote the, the plays and poetry of Shakespeare more than we have that this one man, Homer, wrote down the, uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad. However, it's an epic poem. The Iliad's an epic poem written by the Greek poet Homer sometime around the 8th century BC. It tells of the story of the last year of the Trojan War, which was a 10-year war. So this actually doesn't only, the Iliad doesn't only focus on a year, it really centers on a few weeks of a battle, the 600-page poem. Uh, between the city, the battles between the city of Troy and uh, a group of people called the Achaeans, who now we call the Greeks, there really wasn't, an, uh, the idea of a Greek nation is a much later idea. 
So uh, it's the most famous uh, war story ever. So what started the Trojan War? Um, what started the Trojan War was the abduction of Helen here uh, by the Trojan prince, Paris. Uh, Helen's husband, Menelaus, was, uh, he convinced his brother, the king, Agamemnon, to lead an expedition to retrieve the kidnapped Helen of Troy. Uh, Helen, who became Helen of Troy. Um, and that's why hers was known as the face that launched a thousand ships, because her husband and her brother launched an expedition of a thousand ships to go rescue her. And that was... And I'm really oversimplifying. There's a lot more involved, but this is sort of the one thing we have to point to that led to at least the beginning stages of the Trojan War. The core, I would argue, of the Iliad is actually seen in the poem's first word. It's not usually the first word in translations, but it's the first word in Greek, menin, uh, which is rage or anger. This poem is about the anger and rage of its central character, this character here, Achilles. And early on, his commander, very early on in the poem, his commander, Agamemnon, his boss, right, um, took his favorite prize from him, a woman named Briseis. And he, at that point, and again, I'm glossing over a lot of details, but he sort of went to his tent and refused to fight, uh, refused to fight in the battle in the, in the Trojan War. Later, um, as the Achaeans are struggling without their main warrior, Achilles, Achilles' best friend, Patroclus, decides to fight wearing Achilles' armor, right, in an attempt to strike fear into the heart of the enemy, gets slaughtered. Um, and that inspires Achilles' anger and rage again, enters the warfare, kills Hector, Patroclus' murderer, and drags him throughout town. So to a large extent, and I don't like reducing significant works of literature to a word or a theme, but Achilles' rage, whether it's the presence of his rage or actually the absence of it, makes up a large part of the heart, I would argue, of the Iliad. Odysseus, the center of the poem, the Odyssey, is a minor character in the Iliad. Um, we learn actually in the poem, the Aeneid, uh, written by the, the Roman epic poet Virgil. Uh, that's where we learn about the Trojan horse and the resolution of the war. And the Trojan horse, we'll learn, was Odysseus's idea. He's a very different sort of military man than Achilles was. But Odysseus is not super significant in the Iliad. So some background about Odysseus, sort of pre-Odyssey. He begins uh, in, before the Iliad. He's in Ithaca. He's the king of that sort of kingdom with his wife, Penelope, and his baby, not the sort of cartoon toddler here, but a, a, an infant, uh, Telemachus. He volunteers with the Achaeans. Um, he's at Spartans. He volunteers uh, with the Spartans and the Greeks, or we can call the Achaeans, um, to volunteer and uh, fights with Achilles and Agamemnon and, uh, and fights in the 10 year long Trojan War. And the Trojan War, as it's said here, is a 12th century uh, BC event. And these are all stories that aren't super historically accurately told in the, in the Iliad. Um, Really, the Iliad and the Odyssey are not about historicity. Uh, they're, they're more about sort of a human drama. But the, the stories and the key moments of these two epics would have been known by the audience of, of the poems as they were performed. So as we read in the Aeneid, the Trojan War ended with a brilliant idea of the Odyssey, which is now a sort of shorthand term. The Trojan horse is now a shorthand term for sort of a successful moment of trickery. The, the Achaeans can't penetrate the wall at Troy, and instead they construct a humongous horse 
They hide a lot of the elite soldiers in the horse. Odysseus has this idea. The horse is presented on the sort of quasi doorstep as a gift. It enters and the the people in the night, the, the soldiers in the night escape and it tips the scales of the battle. So I think an important thing is to know that while Odysseus is not a significant character in the in the Iliad, it's his not really military strength like Achilles and and Hector in the Iliad, as we see. He's not really a military superhero as much as he is brilliant. And we're gonna we're gonna see evidence of that throughout the Odyssey as well. And the word for this in Greek is metis. And this means Odysseus is really the first hero, and we see this whether it's in Avenger movies, Marvel movies, Harry Potter, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings. There's a kind of her heroism now that we see over and over again that's as much to do about intelligence as it is strength. Metis really in, in Greek means cleverness, right? It's it's something that that soldiers really need above and beyond strength. They need to know how to get out of difficult situations, whether it's physically or or by smooth talking in their way, their way out. Curiously, this is Athena, the god, the goddess who supports Odysseus the most. Uh, Athena's mother was a Titan god named Metis. So Athena is really genetically connected to this idea of cleverness and the idea of military strength. So it's no wonder that the the mortal that she supports the most represents both military strength. Um, and cleverness. Okay, so that's the first thing that it's th that the the Odyssey is a sequel to something that's really important. Secondly, the Odyssey is an epic poem. An, an epic poem, the best simplest definition of an epic poem, um, I found uh, John Green, the young adult novelist, uh, offered in one of his Crash Course videos. The Modern world also has epics. I would argue that Star Wars is a sort of modern film epic. It has a lot of epic qualities, including beginning in Medias Res in the middle, it begins with part four. Uh, as as a Star Wars purist, I barely count the prequels. I mean, A New Hope is the beginning of Star Wars. Uh, so it just has lots of uh, classical epic traits to it. Um, and I, I would argue Lord of the Rings, while not a classical epic, has a lot of epic traits too. So here's the definition that John Green gives that I just, I borrow. I think it's really, really good. And I have my students learn it. So an epic is a few specific things. First, it's a long narrative poem. So it's a story and a poem at the same time. And that's important. And I would say the long is important too. And I'm going to give some reading recommendations. And a lot of the reading recommendations I have have to do with the length of these poems. So secondly, an epic is written on a serious subject. So how do we determine that? Well, serious usually has to mean the stakes, right? What's at stake? So on the left, we have the updated version of the end of Star Wars A New Hope. Sorry if I've spoiled that for you, but you know, if you haven't seen Star Wars, there's really not much I can do for you. Um, and on the right, we have a sort of landscape picture of the main characters from Fellowship of the Ring. What's at stake in each of these universes is actually the universe they're in, right? The universe of the galaxy is at stake with what Luke Skywalker's up to, and all of Middle Earth is at stake with what um, the Baggins adventure and uh, Gandalf and what they're up to. So really, serious subject means sort of apocalyptic, super high, worldwide stakes. Also, epics have to do with how they're written, not only what they're written about. And epics traditionally are written in a grand, elevated style. This is the beginning of the translation that we're going to read Emily Wilson's uh, poem. And hers has been criticized a bit for being a little more blunt and less flowery, but I think it's great. Tell me about a complicated man. Muse, tell me how he wandered and was lost when he had wrecked the holy town of Troy and where he went and who he met the pain he suffered in the storms at sea, and how he worked to save his life and bring his men back home. It goes on from there. But I tell my students, if you equate literature with clothing, epic poetry would be the tuxedo of literature. It's formal and elevated because what's going on is so important. 
And lastly, the hero of epics are larger than life. And I'm sorry, I keep going back to Star Wars. I'm a Star Wars guy. It's what it is. Um, but you have Luke Skywalker, you know, as an example from a modern story. Uh, and you have Odysseus and, and Achilles. These are not people you'd meet at Starbucks, right? Or Dunkin' Donuts. These are people who have, you know, superhero kind of qualities. And I would argue these larger than life heroes can be seen in the Avengers and the Marvel movies now. They're sort of offshoots of the classical epic. Third, and again, I think this isn't discussed enough, but there's a sort of oxygen that all these characters in Homeric ep epics are breathing. And the oxygen is this truth, that all people in this world, both the Iliad world and the Odyssey world, were under the constant threat of enslavement. As Wilson says in her introduction, through trafficking, people selling and buying slaves, or war. I could be the king of a kingdom, Odysseus himself, or Menelaus, or Agamemnon even, whoever. If the other side defeats my side, I'm either going to die that day or be enslaved that day. So the cost of weakness is either death or enslavement. Th these are the high stakes we're talking about. Fourth, another, maybe the most important word other than Odysseus in the Odyssey is this Greek word, xenia. And xenia in ancient Greek, well, the simple definition for our purposes is here, the two-sided bond or relationship between guest and host. Xenia actually means both hospitality and friend. Um, and the word xenos is, is curiously means both stranger and friend. That's where we get the word xenophobia, fear of strangers or foreigners. Um, the reason why Xenia was so important, and I actually quote scripture here, weirdly enough, from Matthew's gospel. I think there's a really interesting parallel. They're not exactly the same. But there's this notion in ancient Greek literature that you welcome strangers at your door because the, the stranger could be a god in disguise. And the last thing you want to do, as you really quickly learn when you're reading ancient Greek literature, is the last thing you want to do is to bother or upset the gods. So the, the habit was, if a stranger came to your door, you'd welcome the stranger, you'd have the stranger bathe, you'd feed the stranger, and you'd have the stranger sleep the night. And only then on the next day could you ask the stranger his name. That was the level of trust that this relationship forged. And, and we know in, in Matthew's gospel, when his apostles say, you know, Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you a prisoner? When did we see you a stranger? When did we see you thirsty? And he says, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for the least of one of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. It just, it feels like, sort of New Testament version of what we read in Homer. So anyway, Xenia is this super valuable idea. And I think Wilson's translation does a really great job making this the sort of heartbeat of the, of the epic that almost every chapter can be reduced to who is welcome, who is excluded. Uh, and fifth, um, ancient Greeks, if you asked an ancient Greek man specifically uh, what he dreamed of, what his greatest goal was. It was Kleos. Kleos meant glory or fame. They didn't really believe in heaven. Mortals didn't have access to Mount Olympus. There wasn't a heaven that you earned by good behavior or that was given to you by the grace of Zeus. There wasn't that kind of theological belief. Instead, what they had was this notion, and we see it later in Anglo-Saxon poetry as well with Beowulf. They had this notion that if you were heroic in life and selfless, and you, you fought heroically, that songs would be sung about you forever. And in that song, in those songs, your memory would stay alive. And, and I tell my students, okay, this could seem sort of primitive, but think of deceased loved ones in your family. Isn't it common Thanksgiving dinner to tell stories about Grampy or Nana? Isn't that a common thing to do? We don't even think about why we're doing it. It's just sort of a natural human thing that it is one way to keep people alive is to never stop telling their stories. And because this is ancient Greece, people's stories that were most often sung or told were stories of heroism. So this was their big desire. 
Now, some of these tips, this is five keys to reading epics without losing your mind. Some of these tips apply to all literature, particularly difficult literature. First, I tell my students they will not have an Odyssey test. They will not have Odyssey quizzes. Um, we read the poem, we write about it, and we discuss it. They have to include quotations in their writing. They have to be able to pay attention to the text cl closely. But I think the way to kill enjoyment of a book like this is to give a lot of quizzes, my opinion. So I think the first thing is to tell the students, from my perspective, I don't understand all of this. I am not an expert. I don't know what all the words mean, what all the names mean, what all the allusions are. It's really important in the first handful of books of the Odyssey to focus on what the kids notice and what stands out to them and to sort of appreciate any moment of recognition, appreciation, any connection, any interesting question. But Homer, like all great artists, anything that he really wants you to know, you'll know. But if you're reading and there's several lines that go by and you have no idea what's happening, just stay with it. Secondly, and I really recommend this with all great works of literature, get a good audiobook. Audible for the Emily Wilson translation has a great reader and it's really, really good. If you don't have Audible, read it out loud. It's this, this was meant as a performance piece, not a book people would buy in some you know, ancient Greek bookstore that didn't exist. So I would listen and read simultaneously and Funderline, which is what I call underlining or annotating, but it's fun. So my students are used to dad jokes. Uh, what do you Funderline? Things like new names you think are important, new places you think are important, maybe a vocab word that seems important, anything you want to bring up in class or ask about. I would include something that upsets you, put exclamation points. There's plenty that should be upsetting in this book. Um, and anything interesting that you notice that you want to talk about. Just, I wouldn't obsessively annotate, maybe something on each page, but don't obsessively highlight and annotate. That loses the flow. And really, this is an acquired skill. Uh, this is Tyrion Lannister. One of, the, one of the great characters in modern fantasy literature, who's a, who's a dwarf and a, and a brilliant character from Game of Thrones. He's asked at one point, why do you read so much? And he tells Jon Snow, my brother has his sword and I have my mind and a mind needs books like a sword needs a whetstone. So I would suggest pay attention with all your reading, but particularly when it's difficult to the time of day you're reading, to the lighting of your reading and the posture. Uh, if you pretend that cuddling up with the Odyssey at 10 at night in bed is a good idea, look, just go to bed. Don't even bother. Sit up straight. Make sure the lighting's good. Make sure you're make sure it's a time of day where you're awake and focused. I really would suggest doing this kind of work earlier in your homework time. Not that math and science isn't as important, but I think you're less likely to cuddle up with a calculus book than you are with the work of literature. So I'm just getting my camera back. Okay, we're back. Um, I, this is something that's so important, particularly with young readers. But if you're an adult watching this, look, this isn't easy. You know, we have so many distractions and our attention spans are stretched in so many ways that the notion of sitting with a humongous book quietly for 30 or 40 minutes is just so ridiculous in, in this day and age. So I would just say, be patient with yourself. If you find that you really can pay attention for 10 or 15 minutes, do that. I wouldn't suggest reading more than one chapter of one book at once. They're generally about 25 minutes of listening to the audiobook and reading at the same time. But just be kind to yourself, be patient. If you can't do that, do it in two chunks. Do what works. There isn't a right way to do it, but the only wrong way to do it is to pretend that you can pay attention more than you can. Maybe the most important thing, I don't know if they've said that yet, is that, yeah, it's a classic and, and I'm an English teacher and I obviously am supposed to say that I love this. And the thing is, I actually do love the Odyssey for lots of reasons. There's a danger though when when you're opening a book like, you know, Hamlet, Beowulf, The Odyssey, right? And you know you're supposed to appreciate this and you know you're supposed to love it and you know it's supposed to be exciting. 
there can be this sort of reading pressure because it's so famous. I would suggest, sure, you know, it's famous and it's a classic and we know it's important, but it's also a book with people in it. And those people have amazingly ambitious desires. They have extraordinary challenges. And these people are constantly doing things that are both surprising us and I would argue eerily relatable to our life circumstances. So try to keep it just on the human level. Notice what the human beings are doing and pay attention to that. I just really love this quotation. This is the end of Emily Wilson's, yes, it's a 91 page introduction. As I said to my students, it's great when you read her edition of this book, because when you're just starting the book, you're already on page 105, so you feel great. This is how she gets people sort of excited to start this really sort of complicated poem about one of the most complicated characters ever written. And uh, let me just let me just read this to you. There is a stranger outside your house. He's old, ragged, and dirty. He's tired. He's been wandering, homeless, for a long time, perhaps many years. Invite him inside. You do not know his name. He may be a thief. He may be a murderer. He may be a god. He may remind you of your husband, your father, or yourself. Do not ask questions. Wait. Let him sit on a comfortable chair and warm himself beside your fire. Bring him some food, the best you have, and a cup of wine. Let him eat and drink until he's satisfied. Be patient. When he is finished, he will tell his story. Listen carefully. It may not be as you expect. So thank you for listening. These are just the links to the images. Thank you for listening. And I hope your I hope your reading and experience of the Odyssey goes really well. I really hope it does. Good luck.